Good morning. Welcome to this week. Malaysia Air Mystery. <laughs> Why did Flight 370 vanish? This morning, breaking details on the massive search operation, the investigation into what went wrong, and those new questions about why two people boarded the flight using stolen passports. Collision course. Putin's standoff with President Obama over Ukraine. What happens next in their war of words? And stars align. Conservatives crash the Capitol. Our country is at a crisis point. We take it all on, including our exclusive with Tea Party hero, Ted Cruz. Plus, the Powerhouse Roundtable, right here this Sunday morning. From ABC News, This Week with George Stephanopoulos starts now. Hello again. Good to have you with us. As we come on the air this morning, the mystery of what caused Malaysia Air 370 to vanish is deepening. The frantic search for the plane continues, but no signs yet of a crash. We have late word that the pilots may have made a last minute maneuver to turn the plane back. And there is increased scrutiny this morning of as many as four passengers on that plane, including two who boarded using stolen passports. We have team coverage from around the world, including the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, who's been briefed on the mystery and will join us in just a moment. But let's get right to David Curley for the very latest. David. Martha, this is the end of the second day of daylight searching and still no sign of this Malaysian Airlines 777. What we really need is these crews to find some wreckage. Then vessels can listen for the pings of those all-important black boxes. It's those recorders that could solve the mystery of the sudden disappearance of this jetliner. It's every flyer's greatest fear, a plane falling out of the sky without a trace. And this morning, the search continues over the waters off Vietnam for any signs of Malaysian Air Flight 370. The Boeing 777, with 239 passengers and crew on board, took off from Malaysia after midnight Saturday heading for Beijing. It's the red eye. But it was last heard from at the 50-minute mark. Then nothing. No distress call, no mayday signal. This morning, Malaysian officials say there is a possibility the plane may have tried to turn back to Kuala Lumpur. We have uh, probably over 60,000 flights every day all over the world, and that may be a conservative figure, and this sort of thing never happens. ABC's Bob Woodruff is in Beijing, where families have been waiting for answers. David, I did have the chance to meet a lot of the family members here in this hotel where they're living these days. They told me that they're praying for a miracle, that maybe their loved ones are still alive, perhaps the plane did not crash, maybe hijacked and taken away by someone to a safe place. That, of course, really does seem to be desperation. As the search now moves near the end of its second day, questions remain. What exactly happened during what should have been the safest part of the flight? Among the possibilities, a structural or mechanical failure. The likelihood of a structural uh, failure in the absence of a thunderstorm or a mechanical failure bringing a big jet like this with such a superlative record down is almost infinitesimally small. Or possible pilot error. Today's modern aircraft are so advanced, some pilots have lost their basic flying skills, a dangerous situation which the FAA calls automation addiction. And that was a factor in the crash of Air France 447 into the Atlantic Ocean in 2009. Or the most troubling scenario, a deliberate act, a bomb, a hijacking, or possibly even pilot suicide. That took down Egypt Air Flight 990 off Nantucket in 1999. Federal officials are already working, law enforcement officials with the Malaysians, but aviation officials from our country also want to help. So right now, Boeing and the NTSB have put together a team. It's poised and ready to go. But Martha, they need an invitation from the Malaysians, and so far, they have not received one. Thanks very much, David. The chair of the House Intelligence Committee, Mike Rogers, joins us now with more on this mid-air mystery. Chairman Rogers, there's been no direct indication of any terrorism. I know you've been briefed on this. What can you tell us? Yeah, the, the investigation is certainly in its early stages. So there's two parts of it. One, the search for the wreckage, which is incredibly important to make some determination about what happened. And secondly, trying to identify the two individuals who were uh, traveling on, on stolen passports. 
And, and what can you tell us about those individuals and, and how that could happen? Those people whose passports were stolen actually reported that. So why weren't they stopped at some of those checkpoints in an airport? Yeah, it's and unfortunately, this is it's it's not common, but it is not unheard of either that that stolen passports can be repurposed and used uh, mainly for the quality of the of the, the passports themselves. So if given the right circumstances and in this case, clearly it worked, uh, they were able to board and gain entry and they would be doctored up. Uh, they, they would be uh, individuals who would have the skill set uh, to change those passports just enough. Uh, that they could identify with the individual in uh, that was using it. So what they'll do now is they'll go back through the airport and make some determination uh, through uh, cameras and, and other uh, means to try to identify the individuals and then track that back. So it's really very, very early. They're going through those processes now. Uh, Spe speaking uh, and it will be just, it'll be a matter of time. They'll probably identify them. Speaking of surveillance, I know the U.S., the Pentagon has a tracking system and can see explosions in the air or missile lines. Launches. Any indication of an explosion that they may have been tracking and no, seen? Yeah. No, there's nothing that we've, nothing that certainly I have seen that would indicate anything of the sort, which is certainly adding to the mystery. And again, the important part is they're going to have to find some part of the wreckage somewhere in order to start making those determinations if it was mechanical or something else. Okay, thanks very much, Chairman Rogers. We'll be back with you shortly to talk about that standoff in Ukraine. But for more on the mystery of Malaysia Flight 370, let's bring in ABC's senior justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas, plus Colonel Steve Ganyard, who is an ABC contributor, a former Marine fighter pilot, and also an accident investigator during your time in the military. Pierre, I want to start with you. You heard what Chairman Rogers said about those passports. But what, what is happening now in terms of the investigation and as far as the U.S. is involved particularly? They're deeply concerned about those passports. They're trying to get as much information as the chairman said. The surveillance video from the airport is going to be key. They will use facial recognition uh, technology to look at those faces and see if they can find any hits in the terrorism or criminal database. The other thing is the flight manifest is key. They're looking at the pilot. They're looking at the crew members. They're looking at all the passengers, looking for any hint of something that would be untoward that would suggest terrorism or something else. Right now, they say they have no direct evidence, evidence of terrorism, but they say they cannot afford to wait. They have to look at everything possible to try to get a fix on this. Steve, you as a mishap investigator have looked at all of this. The idea that the pilot turned around in flight, do you buy that? I'm still a bit skeptical. If you look at the radar tape, there is a bit of a heading change, but that heading change could be explained as he was Direction. turning on course, that he was just going on the normal course. We also know that they were way out at the very edge of radar coverage. So I've investigated mishaps in the past where we've had airplanes just disappear without a trace, and we found that sometimes that radar data, especially at range, is unreliable. No mayday signal. What does that tell you? What might, if it was a catastrophic failure, mechanical, all those things that David brought up, but no mayday signal. Why not? What do you what do you suspect here? It's hard to suspect anything with any certainty, but we do know that if something catastrophic uh, happened and the airplane blew up, obviously there would be no mayday. But if there was a problem in the cockpit, let's let's set the scene. It's at night, middle of the night, literally middle of the night, out over the broad ocean, black, no horizon, the autopilot's on, things are probably calm. Perhaps something happened in the cockpit. Maybe there's a major malfunction. The first thing the crew is going to do is fly the airplane. In aviation, we have a saying, aviate, navigate, communicate. So the last thing they would be thinking about would be talking about what was going on in the cockpit. If they have a problem, they're going to take care of it, and they'll talk about it later. So maybe there was a period in there where something catastrophic was happening, and they just did not have time to communicate that. I, I think it's extraordinary that we don't know where that airplane is. We have GPS in our cars. We have all these things and yet they cannot find that airplane. In fact, the last radar they had, radar contact they had, it, it could be way beyond that. It could be anywhere. It, it, it could be in a lot of places. There's literally tens of thousands of miles of ocean that are going to have to be searched because we have this black hole where there's no radar data, where we don't know the heading, the true altitude, the airspeed, where that aircraft could go. So it's going to take a lot of time to and find that And that black wreckage. hole is why? The black hole is there because the radar coverage only extends off the Malaysian coast so far and 
it only extends off the Vietnam coast so far. So there's this gap in here. There, the, the, the world's a huge place, and it's not big enough to be covered by radar. Now, if you're going to fly from Europe, you're going to be you're going to be seen. If you're going to fly over the North Pacific, there'll be data link and satellites. But a lot of the world is not covered by radar, and sometimes planes are out there alone and unafraid. Uh, they know where they are because they have GPS, but nobody else knows until they communicate. In, in the past, you've told ABC, and you've kind of been dead on on, on your predictions on, on what might have brought an airplane down. This one is so mysterious. Does your gut tell you anything on this one? It doesn't tell me anything, which I think means that we're going to have to keep the aperture open in terms of what we consider. Normally on this, I would not say that we would look at terrorism, but an airplane just does not come down or disappear at 35,000 feet. Everything's going to have to be considered, and I think terrorism will have to be one of those elements. Pierre, this could take a long, long time, even if they find the airplane. Yeah, they are saying they have to follow the evidence. And the key, again, is finding that wreckage. They're very frustrated that they don't have any clue yet in terms, of, in terms of physical evidence. And the one thing I would add is that this comes against the backdrop of all those concerns about toothpaste container bombs, shoe bombs. The law enforcement and intelligence community was already keyed up, and now they're more so. Okay, thanks very much, Pierre and Steve.